so thanks so much for that so now moving on to my introduction i am devi from devin studio we are a hyper casual studio based out of uh, bangalore we are a two person team and uh, we have been building uh, hyper casual games since uh, for the past two years uh, we have launched two titles with uh, wudu the latest of which is uh, archer hero 3d wonderful yes karan Hey guys, um, I'm Karan. So I've been an entrepreneur in the games industry for the past seven years. So I've attended almost all GDCs, IGDCs in the last uh, seven years or so, except for one. Um, <laughs> but uh, currently, um, I'm co-founder at Firesco Interactive. Uh, Firesco Interactive is the game development studio between uh, the two hypercasual hits that uh, you saw from Crazy Labs in uh, 2020. Uh, one of them is called Soap Cutting. The other is called Acrylic Nails. Cool. Right, Kinsey. Okay. Hey guys, so I'm Kinse. Basically, I'm the head of publishing at Tap Nation. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, in, I was in the um, in the in the I mean, in the um, hyper casual industry since three years right now. And uh, before joining Tap Nation, I was at Green Panda Games. So uh, yeah, that's it basically. Wonderful. Yes, John, you must have a uh, busy session ended and now <laughs> jumped into this. Yeah, no, it's 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 great to be here. It's such an exciting time for the Indian market, right? Um, anyway, I'm I'm John. I'm VP of Publishing at, at Boombit. Uh, we've we're a games developer and a publisher. Been making games since uh, 2014. Uh, it's been a amazing year for our hyper casual team. We've had 150 million downloads, and uh, we're closing in as a as a company on this billion uh, sort of downloads. We've had 800 million, so we're determined to get there next year. Um, I've been in gaming for a while. Um, I was at Omega Games for two years. Before Boombit, I was running Ad Colony in Europe before that, and then I had my own startup which I exited. So outside of publishing, I'm also a very keen angel investor in the gaming space. Um, so I'm not saying everyone send me your <laughs> your business plans are going to fund everything, but I'm super passionate about helping you know studios and entrepreneurs grow their businesses. Wonderful, Rakshit. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Rakshit uh, from Red Force Games. I'm a solo developer. And I've been developing games from past six years now, from 2014. And I recently uh, launched Stack Colors along with Voodoo uh, as a hit game, as my first hit game and my first breakthrough. And yeah, this is my first IGDC conference, uh, which I'm attending, and um, <laughs> and I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rakshit. Thank you guys for introduction, and uh, I think we'll move on to the questions. So we have seen, you know, in last few years, hyper casual games have exploded in popularity, and uh, you know there is a rapid shift towards it, and hyper casual is in the center. So with that, I think uh, how do you? My first question would be, how do you see hyper casual games, and uh, how to approach uh, hyper casual as a genre? I mean, what are the opportunities are there for uh, developers and also the publishers? So I think uh, John, you you would like to share? Sure. I mean, uh, I always talk about hyper casual games being like Netflix, right? There is literally it's just content. There is there is content there for everyone, right? Whether you like, um, you know, slicing something, or whether you like driving a car, or whether you like, you know, flicking a football, or like runner games, is literally content for everyone, and it. Uh, you know, it literally anyone from like my seven-year-old daughter to my nan like plays hyper casual games. It is a global phenomenon. So for me, it's just so exciting to be a developer right now. Like it really is. There's so many tools. You've obviously got Unity. You've got Buildbox, like superb platform and community. Um, so I, I never think I, I just don't think there's a been better better time to be a developer because then on the publishing side, like there's I've never seen so many publishers as well. I'm sure like Kinsey or <laughs> was it the same? I mean like like everyone's publishing hyper casual games now. Like it's yeah. not just publishers. You've got ad tech players that now publish games. You know there's VCs. Um, so so yeah, I, I think it's just a really exciting time to be in uh, hyper casual games. Yeah. Wonderful. So this question is for all the panel members. So I think yeah, Rakshit, you can talk about it. Yeah, for me, hyper casual, I see it as an experience mm-hmm. basically. So you give people some kind of an experience in a short span of time, which they come back to repeatedly. Uh, it's just like what we do, right? Uh, we if we find something super satisfying in our daily lives, uh, maybe the things we eat or things we do, we come back to it repeatedly. And I think it's the same thing with games, hyper casual games. You make a satisfactory experience, and you repeatedly do the same thing over and over again for a couple of days. 
and you get that rewarded feeling so uh, that's that's something which is uh, very unique to this industry really? so that is one of the things and i think you know it's all about the human psychology well, if you if you understand how things work like what kind of uh, experience people want i think then you are already one step one step ahead in this industry and you you will tend to you know take right steps uh, while making games so wow. that, yeah that would be my take on hyper casual <laughs> can see uh, what are your thoughts on it so i totally agree with both rachit and john basically uh, on its like it's like a hyper casual right now it's you cannot like you cannot uh, ignore hyper casual anymore like maybe like 5 years ago it it was possible you know but right now everyone knows hyper casual even some like people that are not really like playing video games on a daily basis they are really really uh, like living with hyper casual you know and as john and rachit were saying is something that everyone do uh, you do it on a manner that is quite you know um repeatedly and the games are super simple at the end of the day so you will always find a hyper casual game for one person even though this person is not a gamer <laughs> so mm-hmm. at the end of the day i think yeah hyper casual is right now something that is really big with a big impact and that's why there are so many game developer right now and so many game publisher because i think this is the definitely the right time to be in this industry yes karan your thoughts about it um okay so i think that um, hyper casual is is a massive boon for uh, the developer ecosystem and why i'm saying this is because you know think about 3 to 5 years back you know you would look at the top charts as an indie developer and you would you would just think okay what is the path to get there right i mean you wouldn't know but today uh, publishers are coming out they're being very open about uh, their processes uh, in turn developers who would not even get into learning about uh, analytics about kpis you know they are educating themselves publishers are educating them so as such i think it has been fantastic for the developer ecosystem and uh, you know from india itself we've seen uh, games hitting the top charts and i'm sure uh, going forward we will see many uh, indian game developers hit the top charts right so uh, uh, karan like you are a publisher and developer so what what is the difference you see you know in terms of opportunities like so, you... <laughs> so i'm not a publisher but uh, we are working uh, we're working closely with uh, crazy labs in fact uh, we are the india arm now we uh, were in charge of crazy labs india and as part of this we're uh, we're mentoring uh, indian game studios or fresh graduates who are looking to get into hyper casual game development you know okay. so that is uh, that is the relation and we're not into publishing we're still a development house okay what is your take devi on this uh, so i guess it's a great time to be as an indie developer i, I guess as current said uh, uh, for 5 years back uh, when people looked at the top charts and there were like massive games like uh, uh, candy crush and subway surfers that were dominating the charts but right now there is a chance for indie developers and small teams like us uh, who are able to create games for the market there is a space in the market and there are players who are willing uh, and looking to uh, uh, these bite size snackable experiences uh, uh, that uh, they would like to cherish uh, um, during their free time so i guess that's where we come in as uh, these uh, tiny indie studios who are able to make big successes uh, uh, in the gaming industry Sure. wonderful so since you know we see that hyper casual you know people are wondering like is it is this a sustainable trend so my second question is like hyper casual games are mostly simple and easy to build you know which leads to a tons of clones even an iterate on your games so how do you deal with that competition i mean uh, there are a lot of games coming up with a similar similar mechanics on chat right so how is the competition and uh, you know how do you deal with it John uh, would you like to share your thoughts on this Yeah sure so um i mean look, there's there's a there's a very practical point here which is that you know if if we see anyone that is uh you know copying a game um and again this word copying or cloning hyper casual is um Uh, is very uh, is it a hot topic but our our lawyers will send cease and desist letters um uh, fairly immediately so that's a practical point and um, from a dev perspective there's a, there's a few angles right well first of all um if you're building a game that's got more complex meta to it um it's going to be a lot harder to to copy that and uh, and quickly versus maybe you know like a more simple uh, ASMR game for example which could be copied relatively quickly um 
I, I think the other point is is maybe also around how and where you test, right? Um, you know, it's it's a big conversation in the dev community, publisher community that, you know, iOS, as soon as the game's published, people can see it all over the world. Whereas generally what we see is Android is um yeah, Private is the wrong word, but it is harder to discover games on the Android platform for a variety of reasons. So I think there are some benefits of um, testing on Android at an earlier stage um, where it may be slightly harder for competitors to see your game. Okay. Kinti, uh, what is your take on this, the clones of it's, the games? Yeah, it's yeah. interesting what you were saying, John, because we are we are doing the same at Nation. Uh, a lot of testing on Android to avoid getting spotted too quickly during the test period, you know. And after, what I always say to the to the developer that we are working with is, at the end of the day, clones you will always have clones on the market. So <laughs> for me, the better the better option to like to overcome this is to like give the better experience possible to the users. So to release the better possible game to the users. If you have an idea, go with go with this idea at the maximum that you can reach the better quality uh, of the game possible. It's not mean that. You will have a super, super polished and finished game for the first test. But as soon as you see that the game has a huge potential, you put all effort on it so that that game can be the one that can be super hard to copy cats afterwards. So that's, yeah, that, that's what I said always is, guys, first we do a quick prototype for sure. But if we see this prototype as enough like interest and the good CPI and stuff, then we're going to push the extra mile to give this prototype a really, really good um, like shape, and so that it can be super hard to copy it. Okay, so John, uh, my uh, another question to the uh, to this is: Do you think that only the new concepts, you know, which which actually uh, published or released on uh, uh, the Play Store, works better in hyper casual? Not the uh, same mechanics, but but with different, uh, you know, the concept works as well. I, I, would, I wouldn't say, I mean, there, there used to be a classic difference between Android and iOS users in terms of like the value and LTV they give you. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily a mechanic um, acts any any differently. There are some differences in terms of benchmarks, um, mm -hmm. like, you know, CPI versus like day one, day seven, that you have to adjust for Android and uh, iOS. But I wouldn't say it's not like, oh, runners work on iOS only, and they don't work on Android, or it's like ASMR only work on um, like Android devices versus iOS. So I, I would say it's pretty, they're very neutral in terms of mechanics. Yeah. Okay. Karan, you would like to share anything on this? On uh, on team versus um, uh, game mechanics? Uh, no, uh, on the clone I'm talking on about. On the clones? Okay. Yeah, um, it leads to cloning. You know. I think from a developer perspective, uh, speed is critical. And, um, you know, as a developer, it's important that you have a team in place or you are educated enough not just to make a prototype. You know, you have to go beyond that, right? At the end of the day, the final target is to get a hit game. Right. So, so you have to be equipped uh, and have the expertise on your team in order to develop the game completely as well. And, uh, and you have to be good at it and you have to be fast at it. And, uh, and it's important uh, in hyper casual to move uh, with speed. Um, there are publishers who do come in with you if they're seeing potential in your game and they help you with uh, certain aspects of your game development in order to contribute to uh, your speed. But, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of, um, in terms of the clones, um, you know, we've seen clones uh, of, of our games. Um, I think when Top Cutting launched, probably like 15 days later, we saw clones. At that point, at that point, the thing is that the game has scaled up quite a bit. Um, they were luckily clones, not by bigger publishers. They were by smaller developers who were trying to sort of uh, milk the the popularity of, of the trend. But uh, at that point, honestly, it, um, it didn't really impact the game at all. And uh, like John said... Uh, Publishers are very active in terms of taking games down if they see there is something that has been copied. Right, right, absolutely. So uh, we see a lot of publishers entering into the market, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, developers are getting more speculative. Mm -hmm. If the games in the top charts, you know, are generating revenues, any revenues for the developers, or it's just for the visibility, you know, uh, tool by the publisher. So how do you deal with that, Devi? Uh, would you like to say? Sure. Uh, I guess uh, John gave a fantastic talk before this uh, regarding uh, 
publisher deals and uh, how you can uh, segregate the different publishers and uh, um, get the de best deal for uh, your company. So from a developer perspective, uh, uh, as you rightly said, it's uh, very difficult to point out uh, which deal will uh, get a better uh, income revenue model for our game. Uh, but then again, at the end of the day, for uh, us at Devin, what we look at is uh, to build a long-term relationship with one publisher who has been able to give you a success. So what we do is we constantly work with that publisher and try and enhance our relationship to a point of leverage. Uh, where we might be able to like crack a better deal with them uh, if the need be. Uh, so that is uh, uh, that is probably the way that we would go because uh, jumping between publishers, it's uh, quite difficult uh, because each publisher has a different process and it takes time to onboard with each publisher. So I guess, uh, uh, and even in terms of uh, uh, the market research, the publishers have a lot more insight on the market research and uh, um, they have a much more idea as to what kind of ideas work. And I don't think they're going to give it away to uh, uh, a publisher or, or, or a developer who uh, just test their first prototype uh, with them. So they're not going to share that valuable information with everyone. So it's for, for us, at least, it's uh, better to stick with one publisher, uh, get to that point where we will be able to get valuable market research and insights and ideas from them, and then negotiate better deals with them. So you see that the publisher do share, you know, where the game stands, uh, you know, with the updates or whatever prototype you have built. So do you see that the publisher also sharing with you the details of the game, the potential of the game is? Uh, absolutely. For us, uh, at least at uh, Wuru, we are constantly in touch with our publishing manager who helps us in, all through the ideation phase uh, where he gives us ideas about the market trends and what kinds of games are in vogue at the moment. So we are always on the right track. We don't uh, divulge and uh, probably sit and do games that are not in trend and probably waste our time on that. So that is where uh, the publisher developer uh, connect sort of comes in. The, the longer you stay with the publisher, uh, the better uh, advantage you have. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is my take on that. Yeah. Kinsey, would you like to share, I mean, being a publisher, what do you, what do you think uh, for a developer point of view? I mean, at the end of the day, to be honest, uh, I think what matters most to the oh sorry, <laughs> what matters most to the developers are like the simple revenue that they will get from their published games, and I think that's that's the most the most important thing for them, uh, because uh, sometimes I mean some some publishers are doing that. Uh, I know just as you were saying, Vashnavi, uh, uh, for visibility, like pushing games on the top charts. Uh, right. And but I think like John will be uh, super like uh, okay. For, like John will agree with me on that. I think we prefer to have like a profitable a profitable game in the top two hundred charts rather than a top one game which is break even or not profitable. Because at the end of the day, it will be super hard to explain to the studio, okay, your game is number one chart, but your game is not profitable. So right. for me, this is the thing that we that we gonna like uh, focus on more is the CPI versus LTV, and if the game is profitable at the end of the day. OK. John, how does this work for you? I think your strategy is completely different. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Kinsey. I mean, uh, at Boombit, we, we kind of don't have a choice because we're a publicly listed company, and we have a share price. So our shareholders care about profit. So if, you know, being unemotional about it, hyper casual, hyper casual games, it's a business, right? We all want to make amazing games and like the game dev community is incredible, but it is a business. And there are two very simple business models, right? It's one, which is like revenue um, and focusing on that because maybe your business is pre IPO and you want to, it's all about market share and revenue, right? And there the sacrifice is profitability, right? Um, so you might, for example, maybe 30 cents, 40 cents ARPU is acceptable to you, right? Whereas actually, to Kinsey's point, actually, if you build your publishing model based on profitability, that's when it gets kind of interesting, right? Because that's when you see a lot more flexibility in CPI day one, day seven. It's not as rigid because you're really looking at the LTV of a game and specifically the category of a game because the LTV of like an action game, it's going to be very different from like an ASMR game. So, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I... I, I, under, I understand your question, like for sure. Um, and you know, look, if you're if you're about market share revenue, the more people you have sending you games, the more games you test, 
the bigger percentage likelihood that you're going to publish however game many games you need to publish on a quarterly basis but it's a very different business model to um yeah building profitable games they are they are different right you, you know anyone on this panel if you had the ua funding we could get a game to number one in the charts you just bid really really aggressively right right that, that, that's, that's so, what you do yeah so one more question to you i mean a lot of developers ask about you know self publishing their games so what what's your uh, you know uh, advice on that Oh, is that sorry? Is that to me? Yeah, John. Yeah, John. Yeah. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so, I mean, look, you. It, 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 I mean, I can't give you advice on this. I can just tell you what options you you have, and I think this is one of the great things about hypercasual right now is there are some funding options available that maybe weren't available a few years ago, and certainly some uh, like VCs and you know some great VCs now just focus on the Indian market, which is great to see. Um, but it's not just about the funding right you need to have people that understand ua and monetization you need to have people that can build creative you need to understand aso so whilst it of course is very attractive because it frees you from the publisher sort of metric model so you don't have to give away 50% revenue so actually all of a sudden the cpi of i don't know 25 cents in a day one of 35 actually means you could make 2 3k a day profit right but you also need to have the team and the tools to be able to self publish um mm. but for me it's it's a big trend i i i'm seeing some top studios in hyper casual now that are self publishing um and it's easier for them to do because they've had a hit game and um, so therefore they've got some cash uh, in the business maybe they use that to raise some money um to give them some uh you know runway for growth um so it's certainly not for everyone and um you can't just suddenly jump in and start self publishing uh, for sure um but it is a for me a growing trend that i'm seeing in uh, hyper casual so my question is to devi um uh, you know when it comes to setting a, a kpis for hyper casual games so what are the main kpis developer should see you know when it is uh, in order to develop games so what are the main okay. kpis uh, as a developer what do you think got it got it so uh, when we do tests we generally start with ctrs although they are not very accurate uh, this is uh, uh, we start with a ctr because it's just easier to build um, it it doesn't have to be playable to be a ctr so we generally test it uh, make get a ctr ready probably in a day or two and then we do a test uh, and uh, if it reaches somewhere around 3% uh, we generally go for a cpi test uh, and uh, personally my uh, our experience uh, has been is that uh, if the cpi is uh, somewhere around 40 cents and the uh, d1 is uh, slightly about 35% uh, it's somehow manageable to iterate and bring these uh, 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 kpis on par with the publishing requirements with the publisher so that's our benchmark to prototype uh so once we get those kpis we i trade on it and try the try and bring the cpi down and take the retention a bit higher okay rakshit what what do you think yeah uh, from my side uh, i do agree with uh, devi's points uh, uh personally i i i think cpi is the uh, main uh, concern here i think that's the most uh, important uh, metric to be considered while designing the hyper casual games because i think that drives the business right uh, completely so even if the retention is high and the cpi is you know slightly higher maybe 50 cents still the game is not profitable so i think cpi is uh, so important that even while designing the game idea you have to consider all the aspects of uh, you know whether it's possible to uh, tweak the cpi in a good way or uh, is it possible to just you know it's just it's just the retention part so i think that's the tricky part retention is always tweakable uh according to me i think you can just somehow uh, get to a point where you can increase the retention by 5 to 10% but uh, the cpa on the other hand is largely dependent on the core mechanic of the game so if the core is good and if it's uh, super satisfying and very innovative i think that drives the majority of the majority of the business model of hyper casual games so uh, for me i would consider cpi to be the priority for any game developer uh, when entering uh, hyper casual uh, games yeah okay current uh, you have anything to say about the, uh, my question is like kpis for uh, hyper casual yeah, uh, yeah. So what, what what do you think according to you what are the main kpis i i think the process is more or less similar across uh, across most publishers and everyone starts with either a 
CTR test or um, a CPI test. And that is the sort of first hurdle benchmark that you need to cross in order to get to the next phase. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, you go into the retention stage, right? And then after retention, also there's a test of uh, the average revenue per user, the R2, right? And because, it, again, um, economically, it needs to make sense. But um, as a developer, uh, you know, you sort of uh, initially think about uh, always crossing that first hurdle, you know, what, what are the best practices that I can follow? You know, uh, a lot of market research, um, uh, trying to figure uh, what's trending in the market. You know, so your focus is uh, when you're building a new prototype, your focus is always on that first thing. How do I make my video basically uh, get the best CTR or CPI? Great. So uh, again, uh, Kinsey, what do you see in a game when you are deciding, you know, whether to publish it or what exactly makes these games so successful when you publish it? Like, I, I would say uh, for sure it, it will depend on the game, but more often what we what we check uh, at first, at least at that nation, when we have like some KPIs that are not so bad, you know, when like when the viewers were saying about, you know, a, a game that is reaching some... Uh, 40 cent CPI and 30 ish retention day one, for example. The thing that we, we start to look at uh, directly is for sure iterate on the game, but the LTV. Uh, like quite soon, we will do our forecast LTV. And the thing is, as soon as the game, as I was saying earlier, as soon as the game will be uh, profitable, even though the game is a bit, you know, like on CPI wise, if you see, okay, I have this game which is 20 cent CPI. This is just a decent starting point for some publisher. But here, if the CPI is 20 cents, but your LTV is like 50 or 70 cents, then you will be able to bring profits and bring money from this game. So that's what we, we are looking at uh, super quickly at App Nation. We implement the ads and everything uh, quite fast in the process so that we can make our first forecast. Because I think this is quite important uh, as well, not to you know uh, lose any opportunity on the market. Okay. John, you would like to say about it. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's, speed is key. Uh, it's about speed and efficiency of uh, developer and publisher time. So similar to Kinsey, I think the sooner you can make a decision based on, you know, for me, if you're just looking at CPI day one, you're really not looking at the whole story. So you've, you've absolutely yeah. got to look at the monetization uh, metrics as well. Because if you're looking at that, by the time you get to day seven and the ARP is not great, you've just wasted a, a lot of time when you could have actually found that out quite early on. Um, so, yeah, it, it's about a blend of, you know, playtime. It's working with your level designers, game designers to dive into, you know, some really basic stuff like, you know, first four levels. If you've not got 90 percent completion rate, um, that's a pretty big problem. Right. So there's it's, it's really not as simple as I think it's easy to get hung up on. Um, I completely agree that CPI initially is the goal, right? Is clear CPI and then and then do work. If you can't clear CPI, kill it. Um, but it's not as myopic as, right, I've got to get this CPI and this day one, day seven. There's lots of moving parts, as we're all discussing here, that go into making a successful uh, hyper-casual game. Wonderful. So, uh, Devi, my question is, uh, you know, uh, when you see a new developer entering into a hyper-casual start, like the space, so uh, what is the average prototype to published game ratio in a hyper casual game? I mean, how can you reduce this gap of developing a game? Okay. Uh, personally, from our experience, uh, uh, it's about six to 12 prototypes uh, uh, between published games uh, might vary. I mean, might hugely vary between uh, developers. Uh, to reduce this gap, I guess it is to keep testing different prototypes. Uh, and then try and understand. Uh, so it's it's not like you develop a prototype. Uh, the KPIs are not right, and then chuck it and then move on. It's not, it doesn't work uh, that way. Uh, we develop a prototype. Uh, if it doesn't work, we uh, analyze the data uh, from uh, what we've got to see if it's uh, the yeah. demographic, if it's uh, one-sided, uh, if that is the that is the key, key problem. And if the CPI is bad, why is the CPI bad? We try and analyze uh, uh, the CPI videos that we have sent and uh, see where the gap is as to why this particular thing didn't work. And obviously, the publishing manager uh, helps us understand uh, uh, with his market research as to where the gap might be. Uh, and then you take the learnings and then you move forward with another prototype. So uh, the 
faster you do this the uh, the, the more acute you are in uh, understanding what went wrong in the previous prototype uh, the shorter the gap will be i believe nice that that's nice actually uh, karan uh, what do you say about this gap uh, how do you define this um okay so for see the uh, ratio that they mentioned right the prototypes to publish game ratio it's it's very very good so you guys are doing something really right i mean uh, 6 to 12 is <laughs> amazing amazing number yeah it's, it's really good um i've uh, yesterday i um, i read a post where someone mentioned that this number was 50 50 so oh man yeah so but but you know the thing is that um, again it depends on the quality of prototypes you're making as well you know as a developer you can't just put out anything and test anything right it has to make sense it has to be of a certain quality level um and at the same time it has to be mass market hyper casual is all about going mass market right and uh, if you can't find a mass market audience then you can't really hit your benchmarks so this number varies from studio to studio but the way you can improve it is with quality is with speed and it's with picking the right concept Hi, yeah. Rakshit. Uh, would you like to say you are a solo developer? So, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, really. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, personally, for me, it's been like one in twelve prototypes. But, uh, but I think if you follow, you know, certain guidelines uh, from every failure uh, from prototypes, you you can crack it faster. Now, uh, basically, uh, many of them just think like, you know, I just need to do something uh, very quickly, like maybe four prototypes a month. It's not about the number of prototypes you do a month. It's like you know, if you, even if you do one prototype a month, but if you have invested a lot of uh, uh, time brainstorming uh, about the idea, about the market trend, and uh, about the previous games data, if you have got like you know the game time and the the funnel of players, like why did they drop off uh, from level one to level two, and so many things like this, you know, your analytics is uh, very important. Basically, every game you test, you you have to be constantly in touch with your uh, games uh, analytics. and keep going through what uh, various metrics and uh, then you get some kind of a flow like uh, why things are not working and uh, what change made the metrics better from the previous game and you collect all these data and then you uh, apply it to the new game idea before even trying to uh, develop it so basically i would say uh, invest as much time as possible in the design stage of a hyper casual game rather than just hurrying it up and uh, then testing it so uh, yeah that's the way you know you just have to invest uh, more quality time for a single game idea rather than speeding up the process by making tons of prototypes every month and uh, not cracking it so that would yeah. be my take i think uh, rakshit made a really good point over, over there is that you know you need to learn from your failures as well you know it's yeah. not like you're blindly moving from one prototype to another exactly, exactly. You, know, you need to analyze the data see oh, what you can do to improve see where things went wrong analyze things go exactly. back to the drawing board and then sort of i trade and work like that exactly basically you should see quality versus quantity yeah that's so, the point it be a quality in a higher end and basically yeah. it's about the market trend right every time it's changing the hyper casual uh, space so uh, the right idea at the right time is what you are looking for so uh, you have to keep playing many hyper casual games uh, in the market yeah. you get an idea about what's going on what's working and what's working really well and what's working like normally so then you get an idea and then you take right decision uh, finally for your game yeah yeah so yeah i mean that's that's really amazing answers okay. so my next question is to you john i mean how do you monetize hyper casual games like how to find that you know sweet spot which balances user experience and uh, monetization to maximize your ltvs and uh, arp so how to approach the monetization model for these kind of games I mean, really, just pick it up on the the conversation we just had, right? Um, you, you need to look at the data. Um, like I said earlier, you work closely with the the game designers, level designer, to basically A/B test everything, um, because really the the ad experience should like enhance, complement gameplay, right? Not impede it. Um, so, it, and it also comes back to. really what Kinsey and I was talking about earlier in terms of really your publisher strategy because you know if you're going for a game that you want top charts and you just want to uh, gun revenue well you know there's a certain mix of like ad formats and you know you may upfront um 
you know more ads because you know your attention isn't that great but you don't care so long as the game's in the top charts for a week that that's your goal um but for us it's very much about being part of the game right so when i say it should complement it you know rewarded videos should be linked to things like you know power-ups revives like upgrades um you know it's a great trend right now around like creating sort of mini games or like vip content that again is like an extra uh, part of the game the the kind of trade-off to get access to that is watching like 2x 3x rewarded videos so i think there's some really nice examples in market right now of how um you know developers and publishers are you know really embracing this versus you know i mean look we all hate it when you look on a, an account and it's just like too many ads too many ads too many ads you know the reality is again hyper casual is a free to play game it requires ads um to enable you know all the people in this call to actually be employed so we can't get away from that but what we can take responsibility for is is what i said is a really nice balance of um ads that are just an intrinsic part of the game rather than this irritant can see uh, your 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 take on this i mean yeah for me the like to monetize a game like on a good on a good approach for me uh for sure it's it will as well depend on the kind of the game but at the end for me you have to to analyze all the kpi all the data that you have based on your game and at some point what we do is say okay users most of the time they will be kind of bored with the you know super aggressive interstitial ads so at some point what we will brainstorm a lot uh, internally is how to make more uh, like good rewarded video into the game and put a lot of rewarded ads so that user can be willing to click on them you know so that we can really think about the user experience itself and about the game design how to implement rewarded video to the game because at the end of the day rewarded video are, will be much more like uh, suitable for your game as users are willing to click on it so revive so lot of exclusive content like skins like uh, exclusive levels and stuff like that rather than having like just an interstitial popping out like this and so being super boring for users so this is how we really uh, focus to make you know the better use uh, the better user experience possible for the users and then for sure the better monetization possible on on this side too right so karan you have a game uh, soap cutting so what do you think you know what ad formats uh, you know work better i mean it's it's really user i mean it's not uh, uh, you know uh, interrupting any user experience and it is working good for you what ad formats do you think i think john and kinsey touched on this in detail and there is there is just one winner in this and it has to be reward videos um, you know it's just because of the way the experience is right the user is sort of opting in to see the ad and and then at the end of it getting rewards so i think um, the if it was up to developers and publishers you know we'd optimize our games to get the best out of reward videos only but you know the thing is the reality is that the conversion is obviously not that high and uh, we need to rely on interstitials in order to make revenue okay and devi uh, is it same for you or you you see interstitial ads also works better for you no we do see churn when there are too many interstitial ads so during the ab testing phase for the game what we do is that we try and uh, tweak the level length uh, to see which is optimal and uh, which causes the least churn rate uh, uh, so that is how we manage it but uh, as everyone in the panel said uh, the worded videos is definitely the way to go i mean we personally as players if we are to think of uh, ourselves as players that is something that uh, we would opt in for as well in, uh, instead of an interstitial popping in, in uh, at our phase every after every single game okay all right so uh, rakshit uh, my next question to you you know uh, being a developer you know what are the challenges did you face in developing or approaching publishers okay yeah, yeah. what's your take I think uh, right now uh, it's uh, very easy to approach publishers. Uh, I think back when I was uh, starting out in hyper casual journey back mm -hmm. in 2017 or early 2018 it was a little niche uh, and you know a lot not many publishers were there. So that time you know you need to make a game in, in order to get the attention of the publisher and uh, and then start testing. But right mm -hmm. now I think it's uh, it's very easy to enter the market. Mm -hmm. But that is one thing uh, but the challenge lies where you know uh, how you crack it so for me as a single developer uh, i think uh, it's it's not easy to uh, you know uh, go through a lot of failures it's uh, 
you tend to become men you know like you know tend to think that it's not going to happen uh soon and then you have to be very creative at the same time and there's so much pressure going on and uh I think this is a very important aspect. So you have to maintain the calm uh, mind in order to be creative while prototyping as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, that is one of the things. And uh, the other one would be to innovate in this uh, saturated market. So there's so many games coming out uh, uh, right now, hyper casual uh, games, and uh, something uh, innovative like you know something of a good mechanic which you which you want which you have to develop is uh, it's not easy uh, right now. and i think it's a very good challenge for any developer to crack this market right now mm-hmm. so uh, yeah i think it's it's easy to approach publishers but it's not easy to crack the market but i think if you keep uh, making prototypes and uh, follow the right guidelines mm-hmm. uh, you can definitely do it so yeah so devi what are what are the challenges did you face and also the, you know there is always a lot of questions about agreement between the publisher and the developers so what what advice you would like to give to the developers when they sign up with the publishers okay so i guess uh, john covered it extensively in his previous talk as well uh, so uh, there are definitely clauses uh, in the publishing agreement uh, which uh, at best uh, as developers you're not lawyers so uh, it's better to uh, take it to your lawyers and uh, take a good look at it uh, in uh, any case uh, um there are clauses uh, there are uh, uh, the clauses are there in order to protect the uh, publishers as well as the developers in some ways uh, uh, so you will have to see uh, what uh, the goal of your company is uh, where you want to be uh, in 3 uh, months 6 uh, uh, months or 1 year down the line and then you will have to choose the right publisher that offers that kind of a deal for you okay K- karan what's your take on this um so in in terms of uh, the publishing agreements I, or uh, the developer agreements before even getting to I the i think publishing. both the questions okay all right <laughs> just uh, did you face and also the agreement part okay all right so um, in terms of the challenges i think um, as a de- i think a lot of developers can relate with me on this um, you know so when you think of an idea or you, you think okay you know i've struck gold in my head at least you know and uh, tomorrow you look on stock glide and you know that game is already there right so or it's already then top charts you know so and that happens a lot right so um, <laughs> that is a huge challenge i think and it's a continuous challenge and you have to accept it you have to move with it and um, i think i think as a hyper casual de- developer there is always one challenge ahead of you and that is to get your hit hyper casual game and that is like your sole focus and um, and i think that is the mentality that developers need to work with you know rather than even thinking about short term payments it's good obviously for uh, people to think about short term payments because you need to keep the studio running but at the end of the day you shouldn't be satisfied with that and i've seen that uh, a lot of developers are okay with the short term payments and sort of taking it on as more of a uh, uh, commercial services uh, business but you know at the end of the day your aim should be to get that hit hyper casual game um uh, that's my take um, but um, besides that in terms of agreements i think um, a variety of publishers offer uh, different types of agreements um and it it really depends on what you're comfortable with you know if you believe in your game uh, try and stress for uh, a profit share you know and and you know that is something that is i think very fair for uh, developers and publishers and because uh, both are putting in a lot of effort and i think a 50 50 split in 70 30 80 20 whatever depending on uh, the way the the effort goes and i i think that is very fair um I know for a fact that uh, there are certain publishers who do offer an upfront amount and then pay based on bonuses or just offer an upfront amount and you know it it really boils down to you at the end of the day you know what you're comfortable with as uh, as a developer uh, what I would suggest is that for every developer going through these contracts uh, make sure you have a lawyer uh, make sure you read through all the terms properly you know if not a lawyer you know you can reach out to maybe one of us on the panel you know if you need advice um understand all the clauses you know um there is something called recoupability for example you know in a lot of agreements wherein uh, the amount that has been paid to you an upfront amount or a monthly amount that has been paid to you for a game after it's published you know um a publisher recoups that from uh, from the profit that the game is making and then your profit split uh, starts you know so so understand these terms you know and it's it's important that before you sign anything before you go ahead uh, you have a clear understanding of what you're getting into absolutely yeah that sounds good 
So my, my next question would be to uh, Kinsey and John. Uh, you know, when we talk about retention, mm -hmm. so uh, how long do you think user play hyper casual games and uh, do ads impact the retention rates? I mean, what is the optimum number of ads, you know, uh, hyper casual game should should have or should show to the user? Uh, what are the retention numbers do you see for uh, hyper casual games? Mm. I think, John, you can... Uh, See? There's like there's like twelve questions in that one. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe I can just reframe it for you. Like it's, no, no, it's right. I've, I, I got it. Um, I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, again, recurring theme of this panel that there isn't there isn't this golden rule, right? It really does depend on like the game, the mechanic, the genre. Um, you know what's in the charts. The, the business model as a publisher that you're you're trying to work towards i mean like the waterfall that we have for one game is totally different to the other game you know the partners that we may use like the ad formats um that we're going to use um you know i've seen a great question in the charts about like some of the new trends around like audio ads so it's really dangerous to have this standard approach in in hyper casual because that will just lead to failure and you'll leave money on the table. Um, so again, um, you know, for us, like, you know, in our, you know, like car games, for example, versus our action games, um, we've got a different, uh, a different type of model. Um, and, and really, again, just, just because you've published a game, um, that doesn't mean like, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone on the panel will, will, will understand this. Like that's just the start of your journey, right? Then you're making more updates, you're continually um, changing your content. You'll be changing your strategy in real time as, um, you know, your like the cohorts at different stages of your game um, start to change. Um, you know, depending on time of year, you've got seasonality that are going to impact things. So I'm not avoiding your question. I'm just trying to help everyone understand <laughs> like the different variables that go into uh, monetizing a game and um, you know right. i wish it was that simple because you know we could all probably work like half <laughs> half as less of the hours that we actually do it'd be great if there was this magic formula that you know mopub or iron source or app loving or facebook just put out and you just cut and paste and you just sit back and watch netflix but unfortunately it's not that easy <laughs> uh, i mean I, I, I agree with john on that i mean you have to be, as a publisher, you have to be super flexible uh, when it comes to monetize a game because every game is different. Uh, if if we take like a, a very simple game, like for example, ice cream or soft cutting, for example, those games will be like heavy on the interstitial side. But if you take a more complicated game, for example, like sneaker art, you will have more like rewarded video in it, for example, you know. So it's always a balance between the, the different games itself and also if you have like, for example, a strong, uh, if your game is working well, for example, on this specific market, uh, because sometimes it happened as well that you have some games that are working super, super great on iOS, but sometimes a bit less on Android or the opposite. Mm -hmm. On some, on some uh, location as well, you have some games that are not as popular in some regions sometimes. So it does happen as well. So it's really uh, hard to, to give you a proper uh, explanation here. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I would say the, the, the major focus, as I, <laughs> I said uh, at the beginning, will be analyzing your ads that your user are watching. So on a different placement, rewarded, banners, interstitial. And if all that gives you a good ARPU and a good LTV, then your game will be good, basically, in a good shape. Right. Karen, what do you say? I mean, uh, uh, what, what would be the user engagement? You know, how much user does play? Game. What would be the session? Oh, you're talking about session lengths. Yeah. Uh, in terms of session lengths, I mean, uh, for hyper casual, four, five, six minute sessions are are good. You know, as, as in terms of average session lengths. Uh, in terms of uh, day one retention, you know, you're looking at something like forty, forty five. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the panel has already touched upon this. Uh, but uh, reality is, in a lot of hyper casual games, day seven is low. Um, and D7 does go down to say 10% or so. Okay. So, uh, Devi, my uh, follow-up question to you. I mean, uh, do you think when, when you publish a game, uh, uh, do you think you should, uh, day one starts with the showing ads to the users or do you think there should be some, uh, you know, cap uh, to, to the release, to the showing ads to the user? 
Oh, so right from when we start uh, the contract, when we transfer the game to the publisher, we add, add all the uh, SDKs and packages in place. Uh, so the the game will already had have, have ads in it, uh, all the interstitial uh, banner ads and uh, the basic rewarded video is always added uh, before we transfer the game onto the publisher so that it starts monetizing from day one. Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I really got your question post that. Is this something that you were asking for? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I want, I'm asking like, do you think when we publish the game, uh, it should be with the ads? Or do you mm -hmm. think after some time, say a week, or when you see when you see the numbers, then you should post ads in the game? Okay. So uh, we actually do the prototype testing uh, in our account before the game reaches the uh, required KPIs, and then that is when we move the game on to the publisher. So we will already have the KPIs. We will already have reached somewhere below 20 cents. Uh, 45 D1 and an appropriate D7, 13, 15 percent D7, and we would have an optimal playtime and session length before we transfer the game onto the publisher. So once it's on the publisher's uh, account, it will definitely have ads because that is when they'll start scaling the game. Uh, that is when we'll uh, see again uh, there will be a drop uh, in in the retention and a spike in the CPI. And based on that, we go on a soft launch and we try and iterate and uh, work on the KPIs again. That's how the process is. Wonderful. See, in most cases, the game has to be tested with ads as well because you need to figure out what your average revenue per user is, right? So, um, so ads need to be there from day one. And in fact, um, for users as well, day zero monetization in hyper casual is also very important. Very, very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. right, so. Right. Very true. The, uh, earlier we know that uh, we will be able to tweak things and uh, bring elements onto the game uh, that will uh, uh, bring us more revenue and also be comfortable for the players to play with so that we can reduce churn right from the day one. Uh, my next question is like, how is iOS 14 going to be impacting this hyper casual market? Uh, how developers should be ready for that? John, would you like to have some thoughts on it? Do we have to? <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, look. If you if you read all the articles, like we we all need to find new jobs, right? Um, but look, on a it. yeah, exactly. Like, uh, but look, on, on on a practical level, um, it's uh, look, it, 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 it's it's going to be disruptive um, for a period of time. Um, there's there's no doubt about that. I mean, the simple reality is is from a publisher perspective is if if you don't have the um, the right data teams to continue doing uh, UA at such high granularity um, that's imperative for like hyper casual success. Given the low margins, you're going to be in a bit of trouble. Um, I mean, I don't want to. I mean, go. In, I mean, there's loads of detail right about things that you can do pre IDFA that you can't do post IDFA around like matching ad revenue back to users. Um, there's going to have to be a new way that you rebuild your BI stack. And use user level data basically to send from networks like IP address, device, etc. Um, so you know for, for sure there is going to be a lot of change, but you know luck luckily we've had a bit of a reprieve on this um, yeah. uh, to get things ready. Um, but you know for sure you should be um, you know talking to your you know publishers and your your ad partners really closely and be um, fully prepared for it. But um, yeah, I'd just like to talk about it just quite honestly that the reality is there's lots of technical articles. Of course, for the next three, six months, it's going to be a little bumpy in terms of fluctuations of like ECPM, CPI for sure. But you know what? Like people are still going to play games. People still want to play games like hyper casual games is still growing. Um, and we still need to advertise our games in each other's games. Right. Those <laughs> things are true. Um, there's just going to be a slight adjustment on technically how we do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, Kinsey, what, what is your take on this? It's true that we would have to adapt somehow to, to all the iOS like, thing, but uh, because especially like we don't know exactly like the percentage of users that will accept the idea of a pop-up and things like this. So this is still an, a non-known thing for like everyone right now. And we don't know as well how it's going to impact, you know, the, the, the monetization itself. So I think it will be like when it will be released, we will have to measure impact and do different tests as well because publisher will have to test like the idf pop-up if it comes like right at the beginning or maybe during the, the the session of gameplay for example because 
you know that you, you will be able to put this pop-up like right at the start or a bit later from the, your user experience. Uh, but on, on all sides, I think that hyper casual at the end of the day, uh, as John said, people will still want to play uh, like games on their phone. And also, I think maybe it will see a rise maybe on hundreds. Uh, so, I mean, it's unclear, but we are still a lot of markets and a lot of like market like like the Indian market, the Brazilian market that are super huge uh, when it comes to Android. So I think it will definitely uh, have uh, an impact on Android as well. Uh, not directly, but, you know, at some point. Wonderful. Devi, uh, as a developer, how much are you prepared for uh, iOS 14? Um, we are not at all prepared. Not, not really sure. I mean, we all know that it is going to be disruptive, but to what extent is something uh, only time will tell. Uh, the iOS 14 has to uh, release, and then I guess it's... Uh, for us developers who are closely working with publishers, at least it's uh, uh, the publishers. Uh, it's on the publishers' uh, side to uh, get all these things through and figure it out. But uh, from a developer point of view, I guess uh, all we can do now is sit tight, integrate the SDKs, and uh, make sure they're compliant with iOS 14. Just get ready for the scenario, whatever it's going to uh, uh, show us with, because. Uh, uh, in hyper casual, the market is always changing. I mean, we did have a GDPR uh, issue earlier, which was solved in some way. So I'm I'm sure this, there is something that uh, the publishers and the uh, the the um, every, every, everyone will be able to figure out a way uh, for this because hyper casual is definitely a voice, and uh, people are not going to stop playing hyper casual as uh, both John and Kinsey said. So we are, we definitely have hyper casual. It is definitely going to grow. We just have to sit tight and wait and uh, just uh, let the marketplace work out. Right. So I think we are almost at the end of the session. My last question to all of you, uh, the takeaways, all the developers should learn, you know, from the success of hyper casual generally. So what guidance can be given to a developers? And as a publisher, what guidance do you give it to the developer? If anyone can say uh, I would say, I would say uh, the, the first the first tip would be uh, try to be as innovative as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's innovative on the art direction, innovative on the gameplay, innovative on how you place the the, the rewarded video, for example, but try to be as yeah, innovative as possible. I think that that would be my first tip, like straight away, like this. <laughs> wow, John, um, what would you say? Uh, I, I would say. Um, just be as unemotional as possible, uh, right? Um, it's a business. You need to follow the the data, as we keep saying. Um, don't get emotionally attached to a game. Um, that's a really bad, really bad sign. It doesn't matter how much you love the game. So kind of Karan's point earlier, it's probably already in store glide. Um, but that's not the same as saying don't be passionate, right? Of course, you need to keep being passionate, right? And, and believing in yourself and the team. Um, but you know, don't waste your time, your team's time, because you've just got emotionally attached an idea that you think is going to be the best game ever when you've got a CTR of like half a percent, right? Yes, Devi. Oh, uh, so well, we are now seeing a lot of uh, uh, developers coming in from console and uh, other genres. Uh, uh, I think the one thing that I would say is that just because hyper casual looks like an easy game, like an easy mechanic to recreate, it's it's not as easy. Uh, it's important to come with uh, an appetite of failure because it is going to take time. Uh, these uh, kind of games, although they look easy, they are quite deceptive. It's quite difficult to build and it takes a long time uh, to understand the integrities of the market. So it is always to have the right mindset uh, to have an appetite for failure and then approach hyper casual because if you, you are coming into hyper casual looking for a quick win and like a quick money, that's not how it works. So that's something. Yes, Karan. I think um, I'd say always be on the lookout for great game ideas. Keep your eyes open. Observe everything around you. Uh, observe everything on TikTok. Observe everything on YouTube. You know, and try and find inspiration from um, from these sources. Try and find uh, inspiration from your day-to-day -day life. And uh, a lot and lot of hyper uh, successful hyper casual games have been born because of this. Rakshit, what yeah. do, you, do you think? What tips would you like to give? 
Yeah, first of all, I think uh, hyper casual, uh, you know, development is very fun to uh, do because you keep constantly keep working on uh, new ideas and it, it it's never boring. So uh, that's uh, that's a very interesting uh, thing to do. So you just work on a game for two three weeks and then uh, you you see the KPIs and then you feel that it's good. Then you continue or else you just move on to new idea. It's you are never stuck in the same place for a long time. So that's a very good thing to be in and. Uh, and i think it's uh, it's good for a solo developer or small team to enter this market because it will give you the required capital maybe to uh, self publish in future and go into a more niche uh, kind of a uh, genre if you want to because i i myself am a pc gamer and i play a lot of games uh, on pc and console so obviously i would uh, want to make a game uh, in future uh, to these uh, platforms but uh, that doesn't mean that you know you can uh, without uh, a lot of investment of uh, uh, team and capital so i think it's a good starting point for any uh, small team or solo developer to enter and uh, expand and uh, uh, you know go into their own niche uh, domains uh, in, in the near future wonderful so uh, guys we have a couple of questions from the audience so yeah. i would pick some questions uh, there is one question for john and kinsey is your soft launch period longer than other hyper casual publishers because you test uh, and iterate more around ltv mm, i mean for us at apple not really uh, because as uh, karan and devi were saying earlier uh, we implement ads directly into the game uh, during the first test so what we do basically we do a, a simple test from day 1 to day 7 and we gather we gather all data possible and directly our our data analyst team will like deep dive into the game and do the forecast ltv uh, with the first thing that we will already have into the game of course the game will be uh, go to like iteration phase afterwards but uh, if i take the example of the game that we release uh, like we release the game within one month uh, so i think it's not like like more than the the standard on the market I, i would say john what what's your thought on this yeah it, it doesn't change anything it's just a more efficient process by upfronting monetization it's that simple um yeah. the the only exception to that is where we're making a a game with kind of deeper meta that we know's got more ltv so then we're not necessarily playing the hyper casual game so then of course we've got more time right because of course um we want to you know just tweak a few more things we've got more content you want to check the monetization so in that scenario um, because we're not playing the hyper casual game of course we have uh, uh more time you know we've got a couple of games that that look and play like hyper casual games but they've got like 15 20% ips in them um yeah. which you know in theory is not hyper casual so um yeah completely agree with kinsey yeah uh there is another question i think uh, how to avoid burnout for hyper casual developers what are the things in common for repeat success in this space i think current you would like to answer this how to avoid burnout right it's <laughs> it's it's a it's a very fun process i think um, but um, but generally you know i think um, making different types of games and uh, maybe tackling different types of sub genres within hyper casual is something that that could you know refresh your mind you know but uh, if you're coming to hyper casual you have to be prepared for uh, multiple failures you know like everyone on this panel touched upon um but um, yeah uh, this is, what was the second question sorry yeah i mean um uh, just i missed so what are the things in common for repeat success in this space mm, i would that's a million dollar question but uh, <laughs> i would say um, i would say speed can be common <laughs> yeah i think uh, i think what's in your hand right that's speed it's uh, the quality of your execution and it's uh, picking the right uh, ideas and concepts you know these three things are uh, you stay consistent with these three things and you will get to uh, hit so um, sooner and more often i i would like to add on this uh, yes, uh, what what is the constant you know uh, for this uh, success in here in this domain i think very satisfying experiences are experiences are something uh, which work always uh, in this uh, hyper casual game so keep looking out for new uh, experiences and try to make a innovative merge uh, which which will make it you know even more satisfying 
and uh, very uh, new and fresh. So I think this is a very uh, important uh, aspect uh, which you have to keep in mind, not just the uh, new idea, but which is something very satisfying to play, you know, satisfying to even look at. So I think this has a very good probability of uh, being a successful hypercatalytic game. Wonderful. Uh, uh, extending, I'm, I'm sorry. What yes, let's do this. Just uh, extending on uh, Rakshit's point of view uh, to to understand what is uh, satisfying in, about a particular gameplay. Uh, it's uh, I mean uh, I personally find it good to uh, research uh, the different uh, video ads that are put out by uh, publishers for different games can be accessed in Census Hour. Uh, just a 10, um, 10 to thirty second video of that you will be able to understand how the ads are being made for a particular game. So it gives a really good perspective on what kind of uh, games people are willing to take up. If, if, it's, uh, some, if, uh, if it's something about satisfying mechanic or if, uh, uh, I mean, generally there are a lot of ads where uh, uh, in the first 30 seconds, the uh, person fails miserably and uh, it, is, it is a trigger. So the uh, viewers uh, see it as, oh, this is something I can do very easily. You, you are probably dumb, that's why you're not going to do it. So they take it as a challenge, they download the game, and then they play it. So uh, looking at, I mean, working backwards, uh, seeing ads and from where we, those ideations came from is a great place to start for us. Wonderful. So I think there are a lot of questions, actually. I think <laughs> after this session, you must go to launch. There are a lot of people waiting for you guys. Uh, I think we'll end with the last question. Uh, it is being asked and I think 68 likes to it. How to find latest trends in hyper casual? Uh, hey, you able to find it everywhere. Uh, I guess uh, soap cutting came from a YouTube uh, trend. Yeah, it, I mean, it simply came from searching for satisfying experiences on YouTube, actually. But, uh, but you know, um, but besides that, I think you need to, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier as well, but you need to keep uh, an eye out as well, right? Scroll through Instagram, see what's trending, or uh, scroll through YouTube, uh, see what's uh, trending. Just be on the lookout for these trends. Um, I think um, one of the games Crazy Labs uh, published uh, this year was a huge hit. It was called Tie-Dye. Um, if you actually look at uh, Google Trends, um, Tie dye in uh, in March or April had uh, had a massive peak, you know, and uh, and that is a point at which uh, Crazy Labs tested and released the game as well, you know. So uh, keep an eye out on Google Trends as well. I think it's uh, it's good to sort of compare uh, different Google searches and concepts. Kelly, right? Amazing. Yeah, I, I think one more thing would be uh, search for experiences in uh, a very old console games or PC games. I think most of the developers are, uh, are gamers. I, I, I at least feel that many majority of them. So I think there are a lot of uh, huge hit games uh, which are dated back to 1980s and 1990s. So if you can somehow convert that uh, into a hyper casual experience, uh, taking the core idea, I think you have a good chance of uh, making a good uh, new hit game. So I think that's where you have to look at and uh, there are so many ways you can convert a, a normal game or a complex game into a hyper casual experience. So it's, you just have to take the over, overview of it and then uh, uh, boil down, uh, boil it down to something very simple and uh, very satisfying. I think you can uh, find a new experience right there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. I think we have covered all the points and th that was a great insights from all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming to the panel today. Uh, thank you again. And audience, thank you so much for joining us. And I think, uh, guys, you can uh, click on backstage, mm -hmm. uh, everyone. And uh, the audience, I think there, is, there are two more sessions. So you can uh, definitely go to the next session. Thank you so much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.